Vishen Lakiani, welcome back to the show. Tom, so good to be back here. Brother, I'm super excited. And what is the number one habit that you think all successful people have that everybody watching this should adopt immediately? Now, I know you think I'm going to say meditation, right? <laughs> I know you think that. Everybody thinks that, but that's not it, okay? The number one habit is actually not a habit at all. It is a belief that leads to a habit. And, and that belief is that the number one thing in your life is your rate of growth. So I call it your rose. You should believe that your rate of growth yeah. is high? You should, no. You should believe that the most important thing in your life is not your family, it's not your business, it's not your money, it's how fast are you evolving and growing. The word to remember is rose, rate of self-evolution. So let me tell you where this comes from, okay? This actually comes from a very prominent MBA professor by the name of Sri Kumar Rao. So Sri Kumar Rao, um, he was speaking at one of my events, and after the event, he came and he told me, Vision, you know what is the problem with MBA programs in America? And I go, what? And he says, they don't teach consciousness. So I said, but they do. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're confusing consciousness with ethics. Since Enron, everybody teaches ethics. Consciousness is what we need to teach people. So I'm like, what exactly do you mean? And he goes, let me explain it to you. Consciousness means this that you are a soul having a human experience and what your soul craves is growth more than anything else. You think your business matters. You think your marriage matters. You think your children matter. But let's just talk about business. Your business doesn't matter. If your business makes a million, billion dollars, who cares? If your business fails, who cares? What matters is, did you grow? Your business is nothing more than one of the most powerful vehicles for your personal growth. And the funny thing is, so are your relationships. Funny thing is, so are your children. Your quest in life is to grow and grow and grow. Now, if this becomes your belief, all your habits align with this belief. Are you making time in your day to improve yourself? Are you making time in your day to read, to study, to watch impact theory, to do a mind valley quest? Are you making time to meditate because that helps you grow, to exercise because that helps you grow? And this is what people forget. We get stuck on this bullshit hamster wheel, chasing the dollars, trying to grow in our career, when we forget that none of that shit matters. It's all about us as a multidimensional human being, and are we growing? I actually agree with you violently. Why, though, does it matter? Because if you grow, everything else in your life grows, right? And we see this so often with, with great well, Why does that matter? Like, do you, so I have, I'll, I'll walk you down the garden path and tell uh -huh. me if, if you agree with this. Right. So I'm totally on board. Whenever somebody asks me what's the meaning of life, I would say there's no meaning that's yeah. subscribed to it. It's meaning that you give it. But if you want to reach fulfillment, do the following. Yeah. Work your ass off to gain a set of skills, to your point about mm -hmm. progressing and growing, that allow you to serve not only yourself but other people. Now the reason that I think that that should be the number one thing that people pay attention to is because it will give you the neurochemical state that is most um, satisfying, maybe the right word, because it isn't it, right. like joy, eating a bowl of ice cream, having sex, all of those things are awesome peak experiences, mm -hmm. but they rapidly attenuate. Whereas fulfillment, you can be fulfilled even in the midst of grief. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's a evolutionary neuropsychological so, answer. So I think, I think here's, here's why it applies. Fulfillment, right? Fulfillment. Fulfillment is what we want out of life. Tony Robbins said there are, there are several sp uh, human needs, but the two most important human needs, he, he talks about six, but the two most important, he says, is the need for growth and the need for contribution. Mm. Okay, now. Trying to contribute without growth is, is, is like walking backwards. It doesn't make sense. If you're growing and you're becoming the best possible human being you can be, that is often the path to contribution. If you're growing, the skills that you're growing within, whether growing as an entrepreneur, growing in terms of your health and wellness, growing your cognition ability, that is gonna give you the tools to go out there and contribute. So if growth and contribution are the pathway to fulfillment, growth is that accelerator. Mm. That's why I think it's important. Yeah, it's really interesting that, so I think about it from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. It's I, One of the things I find most fascinating about you is you can go from evolution to astral projection. And uh, I am very firmly in the, the one camp, but so I think about You're it. You're very firmly in the science camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, uh, uh, uh. So, so am I. I'm a computer scientist, yeah. I'm a computer engineer. It's just that I think that there are things that 
have been proven by science, but not agreed upon by all scientists. And that's a big difference. Tell me more. What do you mean by that? Okay, so one could talk about intuition, right? Yep. Um, intuition is a big part of my life. I write my books through tapping into my intuition. Intuition is very similar to that process that you talk about. I remember interviewing you once and you spoke about thinkitation. Mm. You know, how you meditate in the yeah, morning and yeah. these ideas flow to you, right? What we don't know is where these ideas are coming from. Are they coming because our brains are certainly hyper-optimized or are they coming from outside our brain? Now, yeah, both, what do you think? I think they're coming from outside our brain. From where outside of our brain? So, so now let's talk about the science. Okay. Don't, don't take me into the science yet. We'll circle back okay, to that. From way outside our brain. Yeah. I think we're going to find the answer when we go into quantum biology. Okay. So uh, I'll give people a thumbnail sketch of what I think okay. quantum biology is. I'm not okay. at all right. educated in this. So here's my understanding of quantum biology. Everything that we see interact mm -hmm. with, all of it is quantum. That right. I think is unarguable. There is no theory of everything. So we all know there's mm -hmm. something that we don't know yet that we can't describe mathematically at least. But if we know that all of reality is quantum, mm -hmm. then therefore by its very nature, biology must be quantum. So I have heard people talk about things like mm -hmm. in your brain, if you, we can describe and think about the parts that we can see in a microscope and all right. that, but when you get down to the quanta, you can't. And so there obviously is some function of your brain that is almost certainly existing, and not almost certainly, it must be coming forth from the quantum realm since we all know that on a small enough scale, everything becomes. Uh, so, so let me try to explain it in a simple way, yep. which also can be rooted in science, okay? There are, they are these things that we observe about animals that we just don't understand. For example, monkeys on a certain island in Japan start learning a particular way to open shellfish using a particular rock. As soon as enough monkeys on that particular island learn that method, the same breed of monkey on another island too far away from the monkeys to swim in between mm. start developing that same method. What is going on there? How are these monkey brains connected? Another example qu uh, commonly looked at in quantum biology is... Well, so tie that to... So is why this would an that be information quantum? exchange mm -hmm. between members of the same species? Are we connected? Are members of the same species connected beyond what we can see with our physical eyes? And another example that they're looking at is the certain migration of, of certain birds that fly thousands of miles during a particular season. And these birds know exactly how to fly exactly what direction. So scientists measures, measured the brain of these birds to see, is it because there's something about their brain that's aligning with the Earth's magnetic field? And what they found is, yes, at a cellular level, there is something that aligns with the Earth's magnetic field, but it's about one billionth. It's too small for these birds to actually make any logical deduction. And so again, one of the things that the only explanation they can look at is that there's something happening at the quantum level. Now, I'm not a quantum physicist. I can't explain that. That is way, way, way complex. All we know is there are certain areas of reality that we are yet to discover. I mean, our knowledge of physics is doubling every seven years. And so just because we can't explain how something works right now doesn't mean we can't leverage or use it. And I believe intuition is one of those things. This is really fascinating to me, and I promise you I'm exploring this with mm -hmm. an open mind. Here's how I look at it. So if you had said humans, this would be a lot easier. You said monkeys, and so that gets tougher for right. me. But first, let me, I'll get to monkeys in a second because mm -hmm. it's far harder, and I don't know, I have not heard that before, so we'll right. set that aside. But I just read a book, it's an absolutely phenomenal book by Matt Ridley called The Evolution of Everything. Mm -hmm. And it's basically this debate, which is, if you have a creationist view, mm -hmm. you start looking at things as, okay, there's a top-down sense. It's coming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's coming into your mind. The um, evolutionary lens to look at it is, no, 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 this is coming from the bottom up. And so he uses innovation as an example. Right. And so he's like, what are the odds that two people invent something on the same day unless it's something coming mm -hmm. out of the ether? 
And there's a really cool story. I've actually told this before, so my audience will have to forgive me. But there's this really cool story. Michael Jackson calls uh-huh. Quincy Jones in the middle of the night. Right. He's like, Quincy, you gotta wake up, you gotta wake up. And he's like, Jesus, Mike, what's up? And he's like, I just had an idea for a song. We've gotta record it right now. And he's like, do we really have to record it right now? And he's like, yes, because if we don't, Prince is going to. Right. And he's like, what are you talking about? How could Prince know? And he's like, it's just, it's out there. It's, it's in the ether. Yeah. Now, Matt Ridley would say, that what they're responding to is something is happening in culture where, but it's coming from the bottom up. So Mm -hmm. it's evolving up. And now once people become aware of it, yes, it does feel like it just came from the top down because it it all happens at once. But we're all in the same soup, which is why we're detecting temperature, just to use the analogy, at the same time. So we're in this medium, culture, that's making it feel like something is coming from the outside, but it's actually not, it's the thing that we're in. So he gives the example of light Mm -hmm. bulbs, and he's like, in the West, we all think it was Thomas Edison, but there's something like seven or eight different people in different cultures that have been credited with, no, they invented the light bulb. He's like, but nobody invented the light bulb 10,000 years ago because you didn't have electricity, and you didn't have electricity because you didn't have X, Y, Z. So what you're saying, it's, it's luck and timing, right? Ooh, when I say luck, I wouldn't use that word. Mm-hmm. I can't speak for Matt Ridley. But I would say that the reason that aviation mm-hmm. hit a certain point and then stopped is mm-hmm. because for a long time, your hardest metal was steel, but steel's too heavy. You can't create enough propulsion, right. so flight doesn't happen. But then you get aluminum. And now, because you can smelt aluminum or however it's mm-hmm. made, it's light enough and strong enough that you can have aviation. But until there's another materials breakthrough, aviation has just sort of stalled out. It's been the same for like 60 years. So while computers have gotten faster and cheaper, aviation hasn't changed. We sent people to the moon and then that was it. We haven't created any new propulsion and all that. Michael Saylor, I don't know if you know him, Mm -hmm. fascinating guy, background in aeronautics. He said the reason that he's turned himself into a multi-billionaire in software, even though he has a background in aeronautics, Mm -hmm. he said, aeronautics is just stalled out. It's a materials problem, it's a propulsions problem. I thought, okay, that's really interesting. So you have all these other things going on in this soup of culture that make things seem like everybody is coming up with the same idea or failing to come up with the same idea because of something from the outside, Mm -hmm. but it's really a whole confluence of all this stuff. So I would totally disagree. Okay, so first, so I wanna share two. Are you a dualist? I don't know what you mean by that. Okay, so. But, 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 but let me tell you. So, firstly, when we're going into an argument like this, and it's not an argument, I'm I was really say, enjoying I'm this, so this, this yeah. conversation, right? There's I don't know that I'm right. I want to be yeah, very clear. Yeah, so, so I think that there is something that you're missing looking at. And I think there are certain scientific studies which are worth looking at because they show that the world is a lot more mysterious than we think. But also, there's a psychological phenomenon um, which is. It is an interesting thing. Ken Wilber calls it the pre-trans fallacy. So Ken Wilber, of course. Pre-trans fallacy? P- pre-trans, P-R-E dash trans, T-R-A-N-S. Okay, okay. You, can put it on, you can put it on Google. You'll find a Wikipedia article on it. So a lot of people who follow you, a lot of people in the Western world today are rationalist. So if you look at Wall Street, you look at Silicon Valley, these are rationalists. And rational thinking is important to push the world forward. Now, rationalists, is a next evolution of human culture after we came from religion, from mythology. The problem with rationalists is that rationalists look at spirituality and they see spirituality as something from the past. This is called pre-rational spirituality. And so they look at the talking bush. They look at, you're born a sinner. They look at magical ideas in the Bible. Like, uh, like demons and so on. And they go, God, that is like rubbish, magical thinking. That doesn't exist. But they fail to understand that there's a form of spirituality called transrational spirituality. Meditation falls in that domain. Forgiveness practices fall in, fall in that domain. Transrational spirituality is spirituality that's emerging in alignment with science. Because with fMRI scans, there's so much that we can see in the human brain. Now, people who are in the rational zone, they look at they are unable to see that there are two distinct forms of understanding spiritual nature. So they look at the person who's talking about how a crystal on your chest and the phase of the moon can affect your sleep and your moods, and they're like, oh God, this is such nonsense. But then they put that in the same bucket as transrational spirituality, which is actually being supported by some really interesting scientific evidence. You must understand that there are two. When I wrote my book, The Six-Phase Meditation, 
I'm talking about transrational spirituality. I back everything I talk about with scientific evidence. And in some cases I say, look, there's no science for this, but millions of people do this practice because they notice something change in themselves. So the first thing is you don't want to fall in the pre-trans fallacy. We're not talking about burning bushes here. We're not talking about magic and mythology. We're talking about transrational spirituality. And there are some really fascinating Can scientific you evidences. Can trans rationality for me? I actually so let don't me give understand. you an idea. So is it a cross, does it mean a cross it's, rationality, it's, multiple no, forms of rationality? No, it means spirituality that's emerging past the age of rationality. Okay. Right? You look at the yoga movement. You know, I was talking to the founder of Gaia. Um, he was talking about how he wanted to get yoga mats that he was selling in some major department stores. This was 2003. And they said, nope, we can't sell yoga mats because we don't do religion. Today, you can buy yoga mats everywhere. Mm. The world is changing really fast. You look at meditation and forgiveness studies. There's an exponential rise, exponential in the number of studies on the benefits of meditation on human health. I mean, one of the things we know right now, proven by science, meditation improves telomere length, which is a biomarker of aging. Mm. So you wanna live longer, you gotta freaking meditate. So this is what we mean by the domain of transrational spirituality. Now, what I argue is that there are two aspects of transrational spirituality that are about to explode in the public domain. And these two aspects are this, the idea that our minds are connected, that there is some information flow between me and you, between you and other people. And I'll share with you some stunning evidence to support this. And the second, that our mind can influence our bodies. That when you think about your wife, Lisa, in a positive, loving way, there are actual physiological changes that happen in her body. And again, there's evidence for this. These two things show that we are more deeply connected than we think. And these two ideas are also a basis of, of my new book. Okay, so I wanna make sure that we're careful to separate some things. Your book is amazing, by the way. I've read mm -hmm. it cover to cover. I, I am such a freakish adherent right. of meditation. Um, what you cover in the book, I think if people do, they will benefit tremendously. So I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm, um, yeah. that I'm pushing back on the book. But I want to go back to this idea of dualism mm -hmm. for a second. So dualism, as I understand it, and, and this is probably something I could learn a lot more, but my, my overly basic understanding is that dualism is that there is a separation between your body, the physical mm -hmm. body, and your soul. Uh, so people that believe that those two things are separate, you can live mm -hmm. after death and all of that. I am not a dualist, so for me, I can't I have a fundamental base assumption about the way the world works, quantum mm -hmm. or no quantum. Look, I under, right. at a really basic level, I understand quantum entanglement, I understand information theory, mm -hmm. everything that we're doing in Project Kaizen is actually, a, it's a story based on my layman's mm -hmm. understanding of information theory. So like, I get it, fascinated by it, super interesting, and I think despite that, even reaching into mm -hmm. the future and saying, hey, all of that's true, that quantum computers will use quantum entanglement and mm -hmm. superposition and all of that stuff, um, I still don't think that there's a separation between the body and the soul. And you could be right. We're not even talking about that. That is, I don't know what that answer is. So I hope I don't offend anyone here, but I believe that we should raise children. You definitely children. just offended people. <laughs> <laughs> we should raise children to, as, to, to gain their own beliefs. So when I was educating my, my son when he was seven years old, we watched Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, documentary, Cosmos. And I asked my son, I told, so my son is the product of multiple religions. His mom is Lutheran and Russian Orthodox. I grew up in a Hindu family. And I asked, I explained to him the ideas of life and death in all of these religions, from Christianity to Russian Orthodox to Hinduism. And then I explained Neil deGrasse Tyson's theory, mm -hmm. that after we die, we simply become united with the earth and we are made of stardust and we return back someday the sun's gonna explode, it's gonna engulf the earth, we will return back to stardust. And I asked my son at eight, which belief most resonates with you? And he said, I like Neil, I like the stardust theory. So that's how my children are raised. They are not raised as dualist. Mm. But this is what fascinates me. There was a study done at the University of Edinburgh, and it's a very famous study, it's called the Gansfield Test Study. So they separated people into two groups. In one group, people were in a room, and they were called senders, and they were shown one of four images. 
So these images could be a tank rolling through a battlefield. It could be a horse running through water. It could be Mount Fuji. And then the second group, they were put in a sensory deprivation chamber, right? So basically like a salt tank. Mm. Uh, they were floating in a salt tank. There was super relaxed, mellow, meditative music. Now the researchers would ask the senders to, of the four pictures, the senders were shown one and they had to imagine that they could tell the receiver mentally what they were seeing, relay that information to the receiver. Now they wake up the receiver and they ask, they show the receiver the four pictures and they said, choose, choose what your sender is seeing. Now, of course, these people are not in any form of physical contact with each other. Probability wise, what would they choose? Correct, 25%, right? right? One out of four. But what the University of Edinburgh found is that the actual correct answer was 33%. It was one out of three. Now they can't explain it, they are not saying that, oh, these senders are psychic or whatever. All they are saying is there is some information transfer that's happening. And it's increasing about it. and it's affecting the odds of probability mm -hmm. of these receivers perceiving the right information. I'm gonna stab in the dark here. Okay. I don't know about it. I don't know the study. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Caveat, caveat, caveat. Right. But I could see where one, you're already limiting the universe down to four things. So you know it could be one of the four. Right. And then if people have an aversion to tanks, oh, I don't want them to be sending me the tank. I would prefer they be sending me the puppy dog right. face or whatever. Um, so I could see something like that skewing it to where you get an answer like that. Uh, well, remember that the pictures are, that the senders don't get to choose what they want to send, right? I mean, this study was corrected for all of these things. And there are multiple studies that show similar results, that there's an information flow between people. Now, this is not scientific. In fact, it's quite- But for instance, do you think that it would remain 33% if there were 100 images? Um, so there, were, there are studies like this, and what they show is that there's, the odds of guessing correctly typically tend to be higher. There was another study, so let's talk about that. There was another study done by Professor John Michalowski at the Newark College of Engineering. It was a study on CEOs and intuition. So this was a very simple study. CEOs had to guess a, a specific card type. Again, five cards, your odds of guessing correctly are 20%. Certain CEOs could guess 23, 24, 25% correct. Now this is done over hundreds of trials. Now here's what was interesting about Mihalaski's study. He found that the CEOs that seemed to guess correctly more often, it also correlated with profitability increase in their companies. So again, we, we, there is multiple studies that show that certain people guess correctly more often outside the laws of probability. I believe, and, but, and also these studies also show that this guessing tends to happen when we are in a relaxed state of mind. So what Can't do you think is it. happening there? I believe, intu I believe that there is something called intuition. There's something called intuition and that in some way, all human beings are connected. But does that mean that the, the universe, quote unquote, is broadcasting the right answer and you just have to be in tune with we it? We don't know, and it's dangerous to make assumptions like that. But what we know is this. Why is when it dangerous? You can, it's dangerous to make assumptions like that because it, it may take you down the wrong path. But let's go back to what you do. You meditate in the morning and you say incredible ideas come to you. You call it incitation. Mm -hmm. What these studies are showing and what you're doing when you're meditating is you're going in a relaxed state. All these studies are showing is that when you go in a relaxed state, information is clearer to the point where sometimes information that you shouldn't know, you seem to know at higher than odds of probability. We can't explain how it works. Can you give me an example of shouldn't know? Something I so, should know? So the CEOs who are guessing these cards correctly, mm -hmm they shouldn't theoretically be able to guess out of five cards beyond a 20% probability. The Gansfield test experiments at the University of Edinburgh, there is something that's causing this fluidity of mind where you're getting information at an easier rate. That could explain why thinkitation works for you. It's interesting, I would definitely, I'm super curious to look at these yeah. studies, anything that gives me an edge, I'm all for yeah, well, it. Yeah, well a good book on it, a good book on it is Best Evidence by Michael Schmicker, or The it's Conscious Universe. Best Evidence? Best Evidence by Michael Schmicker. Right, hold on, right, he was right. a journalist who was asked to debunk all of this, and he became a believer. Another book is um, The Conscious Universe by Dean Radin, PhD. These books, um, beautiful meta-analysis of all of these studies. So I love that we're going down this path. Yeah, so let's um, let's go back. I wanted to ask you a question. So if you were designing the way mm -hmm. the world worked, would you design this thing in where, hey, the more you relax, the more that you can pick up on this frequency? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. You wouldn't make it more but obvious. I wouldn't, but, I, but, I, but if you're teaching this in schools, you're not talking about intuition. What, what we know for sure is that when you're in a relaxed state, creative ideas flow. Creative yeah, ideas I'll agree flow with that, but so here's state. how I, so we actually, my, um, my wife is the lead on a project that we're mm -hmm. doing called The Wish Academy. Right. And the main girl's original superpower was gonna be intuition. Mm -hmm. And I was like, over my dead body. And Lisa was like, why can't we make intuition a superpower? And I said, because intuition has to be trained. I think people have intuition, right. but you're not gonna have intuition about something that you, it's completely abstract. Like let's say um, intuition about uh, alien biology, right? Something where right. if something completely a nine-year-old that's right? never encountered human yeah. biology suddenly has intuition about something that literally could not be more, even that it would have to be non-DNA based because even that, like if you grew up in a DNA based society, it's possible there's something there, but to have intuition about something to which you truly know nothing, I think is basically a 0% chance of that. Right. But if you've grown up studying something, thinking about something, and this is why I think attention works for me is I'm now able to quiet my mind such that areas of my brain that don't normally talk to each other begin mm -hmm. talking. And so it can, op one side of my mind, <clears throat> let's say a more creative side, can offer up to my logical side, well, what about this really random thing that you never would have put together right. through association? Something exactly. like that. Exactly, and I've had these conversations with, with people like Stephen Kotler, right? Stephen Kotler teaches on Mind Valley, and, and we had, a, we, we had a conversation on this and I asked Stephen, what do you believe? And he says, look, when you rest your mind, Stephen is a rationalist, he doesn't believe in intuition, but he believes there's some, there's some optimization of your brain state so answers come to you faster. And that's all we are talking about. You don't have to believe in intuition to do the sixth phase. In fact, that word, that topic isn't even discussed in this book. But what we do say is that creativity is magnified when you're able to access these states. And this multiple times it's been proven. The most recent experiment, they wanted to see if Edison was famous for taking his afternoon nap. So they wanted to see, is there something to Edison's napping practice, right? Was there something to his napping practice that made him come up with all of these inventions? He's the one that held the metal ball over the plate. Yeah, yeah, there was this story that Edison holds a metal ball in his hand and when he di dri drifts off into sleep, his hand drops, the ball hits a plate creating a loud clang. It wakes him up and it helps him solve problems. So scientists did this with a group of people and uh, they were given a math problem to solve. One group was told to solve it the traditional way, just you know, busting your mind on it. The other group was encouraged to take naps. They found that the group that napped was 80% better at solving the problem. So again, evidence that getting in this restful state creates a, a clarity of mind that helps us get more creative, whether it's problem solving or creativity. I agree with all that. I'm just creativity. trying to figure out the interpretation that right. this is coming from the outside, that there is something that you but would- you But you don't have to believe that. We're not even talking no, about that. No, but isn't it, it's interesting. So I, I am fascinated because mm -hmm. I don't share that and it seems so, it's contrary to you all the base assumptions that, that I've built You are a rationalist and you may be falling for the pre-trans fallacy. Super And you possible. are stubborn about it. And you're stubborn about it. Now, also, the, the reason is because there are lots of hokey people who call themselves psychics who mm. manipulate others, and they give a bad name to the idea of intuition. But what I want to know is why, if you were creating the universe, why would you build that in? What am I missing? Why would that make it better? So, think about the, that, it's called, a, I think it's called the 100 monkey theory, right? This observation that species suddenly pick up skills. It helps survival. Explain the hundred monkey. Pieces. So I told you the monkeys, a particular group of monkeys in an island of Japan, learn to use certain tools from right? each other. The separated one, thing is one where... monkey figures this out. Figures out, for example, how to use a rock to break open shellfish. Mm -hmm. All the other monkeys on that island learn. Now that you can say is true imitation. But what happens is when a, when a large number of monkeys on that island learn that, the same species of monkey on an island far away start picking up, start doing the same thing. And so you don't think that that's just a natural evolutionary process, which is why it happens at roughly Why is the same it so time? hard to believe that we don't know everything about the world that we live in? We don't know everything about the exactly. world. Exactly. So Our that, knowledge of physics doubles every seven embrace. years. And so, and so all I'm saying is we, we are observing these things. Mm -hmm. We're observing these things and we know that there's something there. We can't explain it. Nas so, Nassim Haramin, I don't know if you've had him on the show, but he says, Spirituality is nothing more than physics we have yet to find an equation for.
What is up, my friend? Tom Bilyeu here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10? If your answer is anything less than a 10, I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline, by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring, and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called How to Build Ironclad Discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. Interesting. Uh, sure. What I'm trying to get to is one, I'm always checking to see if the things that I believe are more likely to accurately predict the outcome of my behaviors, mm -hmm. which will allow me to go to my goals faster. Um, so if there is something here, that's why I was asking, like, is this a better way to create the universe? So when I look at the way that we're solving problems in the world mm -hmm. now, is it my base assumption is that we're making catastrophic errors of judgment right now at this moment in history from a cultural perspective. We're taking a top-down approach. Right. I think it's dangerous and I think it's gonna lead people to some really mm -hmm. horrific outcomes. So as I think through this and thank you and thank you to everybody at home that's letting me think through this in real time because I don't have a yeah. strong stance on this. I'm really exploring um, something at the edges. So a few years ago, culture started to make its way onto my radar. Mm -hmm. I'd never thought about it before. I was just trying to build businesses so I could tell stories and that was it. And then as I stepped in front of the camera, it started to occur to me that there were definitely a lot of things happening in the world that I had previously been unaware of because I had my head down mm -hmm. and I was just building, building, building. And then the more I looked around, the more I saw how algorithms were pulling us sort of down these chutes and I wanted to seek this confirming evidence, then I started to really think about, okay, why do I believe what I believe? What is truth, first mm -hmm. of all? So I have a definition for truth, which is it's that which allows you to predict the outcome of your behaviors mm -hmm. or anyone's behaviors, the cause and effect, that you're way better at understanding cause and effect, predicting cause and effect. Mm -hmm. That seems like the closest thing to what is objectively true. So having Donald Hoffman on the show, uh, I don't know if you know him, but his whole thing is, Everything you think about the world is an illusion, like just from top to bottom. Right. You don't see anything real, it's all fake. But his whole thing is that evolution drives you to that conclusion because it's taking you to a place where your actions lead to the right outcomes. Mm -hmm. And while he didn't say the words that I'm saying, so I don't wanna misrepresent his beliefs, that when I think about in my own life, I've always told people do and believe that which moves you towards your goals. Then the natural question is, well, would you believe something that's untrue? My thing is that doesn't sit right with me. So no is my knee jerk reaction to that. And I was like, well, why wouldn't I believe something that's untrue if it makes my life better? And I was like, well, how would something untrue make my life better? And the answer is it wouldn't. So the things that make my life better, assuming that I'm well adjusted and I'm not schizophrenic, it's the things that are going to allow me to have my relationship be thriving, have my business be thriving, to meditate and know that it's gonna help me, to do things and be able to understand, whoa, this is an improvement. Now, we right. could take the time to define what I think every human is unintentionally optimizing for, but I'll set that mm -hmm. aside for a second. So I'm trying to get to truth, meaning that which allows me to function more effectively okay. in the world. So let me ask you an interesting question. Yep. Your wife, Lisa, is, is sick right now. Yep. Do you believe that if you were to close your eyes, go into a restful state and think about Lisa and feel love for her and send her that love and imagine as if you were sending love and goodness and good vibes to her, that it would help her body heal. No. You don't believe that? I don't. Okay, that. so that, that's fine. So let's talk I'm about open that. To being wrong. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about that, right? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be amazing if that was true? The, the poet Rumi said, and he's, he spoke to lovers when he said this, I can close my eyes and talk to you in a thousand silent ways. And poetically, it sounds cool, but is there a practicality to it? Mm. So one of the other studies that really interests me is this. 
It was a study done by Dr. William Broad at the San Antonio Mind Science Institute. And I'm giving these names because people who are doubting this, I want you to be able to Google this and look yeah, into yeah. it, right? So what in the study, what they did is they took several hundred people and they put them in two rooms. One was senders, one were receivers. Now, the receivers were hooked up to 19 different machines that measured their biology. So skin resistance, which is a biomarker of, of how rested you are, your heart rate, your brainwave activity, your breathing, and so on. And at a particular time, the senders were told, okay, imagine you're sending good vibes to the receiver. That's all. Good vibes could be well wishes, prayers, whatever. You're just thinking positively about someone. At that specific time, 1.53 p.m., the receivers, the doctors would monitor, things change about their biology. Their skin resistance might go up, which means that they are sweating less, which means that they are getting in a more restful state. Their EEG activity might go from beta to alpha, which again shows that they are they're relaxed, they're feeling good. And we can't explain this. We can't explain how someone thinking positive thoughts about someone else actually increase influences their biology. Did the person being thought of know they were being thought of? No, not at that particular. Okay, now, let's say you don't believe that. You still deny the study. You don't care about William Broad's research. It doesn't prevent you from doing the six-phase meditation. So when we start the six-phase meditation, we actually start using a exercise to increase love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Why? Because compassion has been studied. If you can increase your compassion and your kindness, it improves your productivity at work, it makes you a better leader, it makes you a better boss, makes you better in your relationship, but it also makes you live longer. It reduces headache, it makes you sleep better, it reduces feelings of depression and anxiety. Now, how do we activate uh, the sixth phase? We start by seeing the picture of the person on the planet you love most. For me, it's my children, Hayden and Eve. Seeing their face, feeling that love, feeling that love for them in your heart area, and then imagine you can send that love to wider and wider and wider circles of humanity. So I feel the love for my daughter and my son, I feel it in my heart area, and I imagine I can beam it out to wider areas of humanity. Now, it doesn't matter if you think the William Broad studies are bunk and that this is not gonna affect humanity. What the HeartMed Institute in Los Gatos found is that by just thinking about the person you love, your heart resonance, which is another biomarker of wellness, shifts in favorable ways. Within a minute of doing this, within a minute of closing your eyes and seeing Lisa, for me, within a minute of seeing my daughter Eve in my mind's eye, my heart, my heart resonance changes. And heart resonance is basically a, um, a subtle measurement of what's going on between your heartbeats, mm -hmm. and it correlates with wellness. Um, it changes. And so we don't, you don't have to believe that we can connect across time and space. It's been studied and your biology directly changes from these exercises. So the sixth phase, phase one, two, and three, are all psycho-spiritual transcendent techniques, and I can explain what that means, that instantly shift your biology and your cognition so you're showing up better in the day. If you wanna believe that you can influence in a subtle way the biology of your loved one, sure. You wanna believe that you can improve your intuition, sure. I believe that, you don't have to believe it. I've given you the study so you understand why I as a computer scientist believe it, but even if you don't believe it, studies show that it does cause favorable changes in your body. Over 15,000 studies. Yeah, the it impacting you, that experientially, I was gonna mm -hmm. say that's undeniable. I won't say that, right. but I will say experientially, and of one, that's undeniable. Yeah. It, meditation has been transformative in my life. The six phase meditation that you walk people through is really awesome. Right. So the thing that we've been exploring is the word that suits how I feel, mm -hmm. is whether this is coming from the outside and whether that right. would be better. The inside part I've just felt, I know yeah. it's super effective and I get that. I get how the mind is gonna wildly impact your own physiology. I can even get that, it, I'll, I'll say it this way. If I were diagnosed with terminal mm -hmm. cancer tomorrow, a thousand percent, I would imagine my cells attacking it right. and it melting away and I would get yeah. myself to believe it and I'd be like, I thought this is gonna work, 100% guaranteed. I would also do all of the dietary things and exercise exactly. and all of that stuff. Because but, there's evidence for that, right? Uh, at that point, I wouldn't even really care about evidence. I would do anything you would do I anything thought you can, could possibly maybe have a positive effect. The exact 
So that's phase four. Phase four is visualization. And you can use that to manifest your goals or even heal yourself. So the exact phase four protocol here is from the Silva method, which is now run by Mind Valley. Dr. O. Carl Simonton, the cancer research pioneer, tested this. This is crazy. On a group of 159 cancer patients, um, again, Simonton Cancer Research Center. And what he found was this. The average lifespan, these were patients who were terminal, they were given 12 months to live. The average lifespan increased to 24.4 months. Um, I believe 17 patients went into, they saw their cancer reduce, 14 saw their cancer completely disappear. Now again, these are 14 and 17 out of 159, right? So the odds are still only 20, 30%. But yeah, those odds exist. And Simonton said about the Silva method is the single most powerful tool I have to offer patients. That is in this book. The Silva method constitutes, which is inherited by Mind Valley now, constitutes space four. So there is evidence for this. It doesn't work, it didn't work for the majority of people but it worked for enough that it's worth looking at. No doubt, I mean, when it comes to that, anything is worth looking at. My, so my fundamental question, the thing that I am, the thing that I have a thesis around, I could mm -hmm. not be more open to being wrong, but the thing I have a thesis around is this idea of something coming from the outside. To me, all the things you can do on yourself and your own body, mm -hmm. all of that makes sense. I don't understand, even from just a pure evolution, so one, again, to your earlier question, do you, I do, do you not know how the world works. Do you understand the intricacies of how your mobile phone works? No, that's what I was gonna but say. But you can still use it, right? Yep. So you don't have to understand how it works. There's enough evidence that we are connected beyond time and space. There is enough evidence for that that suggests that that may be but true. But real fast, if and, somebody were to tell me, hey, uh -huh. you don't understand the way your mobile phone works, right? Yeah, correct, but you still use it, correct. But if somebody is telling me, hey, all you have to do is think, I hope my wife calls me, and then she'll call me. That's where I'm like, uh, I think yeah, it's better no for me that. to send her a text and say, no call me. No one is me. saying that. What we are saying, so, but no, one, I never said that. So you're putting words in my mouth. What I said is, and I encourage you to try it, if you think beautiful, loving thoughts about your wife, Lisa, there is a subtle shift, a subtle shift in her biology and in her emotional states because you are connected. That's all I'm saying. And I'm saying, and, wh and whether that is true or not, it's a beautiful idea, because why shouldn't you think beautiful thoughts about the people you love? Agreed, it's a fascinating idea, but remember I go back to what is going to allow me to better predict the outcome of my behavior. So that will certainly help me. I don't know that it will help her, but I remain curious. So going back, do you have a hypothesis around why the universe would be constructed in a way where there is this, I don't know what word you would use, truth, uh -huh. right answer, whatever that's being broadcast, right. why would that be better than, say, just being born with that information already inside of you? Well, I think if we were born with all the information we need inside of us, what would be the point of discovery? What would be the point of innovation? We're not gonna have there all of this point, information though. in front of us. So I have a hypothesis about how things work. I call it a hypothesis mm -hmm. for a reason because I don't know. I have no idea if this will end up panning out, but in my quest to be able to predict the outcome of my behaviors, I need a working idea. Right. So my working idea right now is that things are completely blindly constructed from the ground up, from an evolutionary perspective, meaning the, the idea, Richard Dawkins' idea of right. the blind watchmaker. Mm -hmm. So you get a watch, it seems so incredibly complex. How could this ever have been created if it wasn't created specifically to tell time? Right. Or the example that's often used, how could an eye have ever been created if it wasn't designed to see? Right. And so my thing is that the idea of a truth being broadcast and we mm -hmm. have to learn to relax so that we can receive something from the outside, mm -hmm. that breaks my entire model of the world. It does. So now right. I'm trying to, to build a new model. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need to understand how all the pieces connect. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to yes. get to. You have to understand how the pieces connect, but you also have to understand what your worldviews are. Because if you have a worldview that is resistant to this model, you're not gonna be able to see it. Ken Wilber talks about this in terms of worldviews. People across the world fall into different buckets of worldviews. You have the militaristic worldview, like people of North Korea. You have the religious worldview, like people of uh, evangelical states or a country like Iran. You have the spiritual worldview that you see in Burning Man. You have the rational worldview of, of Wall Street. The problem is all of these worldviews think they are 100% correct, and they look at the other worldviews, in Ken Wilber's uh, words, as goofy. 
and thus immediately you shut down. There is some truth in all of these worldviews. What you want is an integrated or integral worldview where you can understand where all of these views come from, their historical narratives, and what is truth and what is untruth. That's the most important thing. So really, we're talking about moving to, in terms of worldviews, the purple or the integral level of the consciousness spectrum. Why purple? That's just the color. So Ken will be used as a color code to define it. You don't want to say level one, level two, level three, because that implies that one is higher than the other. Got right? It. When you go with colors, colors do not dominate each other. You don't have a, domina, a, a dominating hierarchy. That's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm saying you got to, um, you, you can study all of the signs, but if your worldview is locked in one area and you haven't moved on to integral, of me. So what my, happens is that it becomes harder. So I, I am so obsessed with mm -hmm. what is useful. I'm certainly not dogmatic in my thinking, right. but I only bring things into my worldview if I can um, see how the pieces connect and try them out and use them, Great. right? So for instance, the example I've used very often is when we were first introduced to Newtonian physics, mm -hmm. it was like, oh my God, this let you yeah. predict how planets moved it 100%, it's accurate. Mm -hmm. Then we get Einstein's relativity, then general relativity, or sorry, general relativity, then special, I can't remember which one came first, but both layering on. And so we realized, oh my God, Newtonian physics wasn't actually as right. right. And by getting the further information around relativity, mm -hmm. now we're able to do things like GPS and all of the incredible things, nuclear mm -hmm. power and all of that. So the more right you can be, it, it really is world changing. Yeah. So I'm looking for that next breakthrough. I would love for this to be the next breakthrough. I'm just trying to figure out I don't think it's an unwillingness or a stubbornness for me to figure this out. I just need to understand how these pieces yeah. connect. Setting that aside, I'm not sure we're gonna get much farther with that and I don't wanna end up in like a whole debate <laughs> about truth and then it just spirals into madness, no, but, but this that's is utterly really, fascinating. But, but, I'm, but I'm loving this discussion because it's so different from any other interviews I've had on this book. Well, to be clear, yeah. we, we haven't even gotten to the book yet. Like we will, I don't want people to think that anything right. that we've talked about so far, mm -hmm. what I've been trying to explore is this idea that something's coming yeah. from the outside. Okay. Setting that aside, how did you come down to the six things in the six phase protocol? Why not seven, why not four? Right. So it started out this way. I was a former Silicon Valley exec. I discovered meditation and it completely changed the course of my career. I was in Silicon Valley during a really horrible time, 2001, the dot-com bubble burst. Mm. And then September 11 hit, I lost my job, I lost all my money. I lost the money I borrowed from my father to start my company. I was sleeping on a friend's couch. And I remember I was so broke, I couldn't even fix the brakes on my car. And I crashed into a minivan, um, carrying two kids, right? And fortunately, nothing happened. But I was, it was a horrible time. I had to pay for all of that. And as a result, I couldn't even afford rent. So it was during this time that I stumbled upon meditation. I was Googling online for answers. I was trying to figure out why my life sucks so bad. And that practice of meditation that I learned completely shifted me. I had a job at that point, really low level. In four months, I went from low level, entry level to vice president of sales because I was just so good at my job as I started bringing in these protocols that I was learning from meditation. Protocols such as being able to be really peaceful and Zen. It's called equanimity during stress so you can focus better, being able to increase your levels of creativity so you have better ideation, being able to visualize your goals and then move towards them. And so I stayed with the company for 18 more months and then I was thinking, man, this stuff, all the stuff I learned at my electrical engineering and computer science degree from the University of Michigan, which I paid maybe a quarter million dollars for in that time's money, was nowhere as useful as this weekend meditation class. So I decided to quit and become a meditation instructor. So I did that for five years. During that time, I built Mind Valley. Mind Valley became a massive company with about 100 million in revenue, valuation of man. a billion, um, with no VC funding, no investors, no bank loans. And I attribute it to this practice of meditation, being able to go within. Building up Mind Valley, there were at least three times I almost lost it all. But being able to go within, being able to, to train your brain to even go through that level of chaos, help me as an entrepreneur. And so 10 years ago, 
at this point, I'd interviewed, you know, hundreds of people. Today, I've interviewed thousands of people across all Mind Valley programs, all Mind Valley podcasts and platforms. And I wanted to build a personal growth practice for myself that I would have the discipline to do every morning. And I wanted something that I could do in 15 minutes because I'm busy, we're busy, we're all busy. That would give me the maximum benefit in the tiniest, teeniest amount of time. And that was the sixth phase. There were six practices that I found. Now, these are not traditional meditation. So if you're a hardcore meditation purist, this book will probably piss you off, right? But these are six practices. They are called psycho-spiritual transcendent techniques. Psycho, because many of them are rooted in psychology. Spirituality, because many of them do have a spiritual ideology to it as well. Not religious, spirituality. Again, big difference. Define the difference for me. We'll come to that. And then transcendent, because you're going within. You're disconnecting from the outside world. You're going within and everything is run in your head. Okay, now these six practices have been proven by science to create a massive positive impact in your life. Um, the first one has to do with compassion. The second one have to, has to do with happiness. The third has to do with forgiveness. Now these three constitute your emotions in the present. But in today's world, it's not just enough to be blissful in the present. We gotta go out there. We, we wanna build companies. We wanna change the world. We wanna create revolutions. So the next four phases, four, five, and six, are about that. They're about creating, they're about action. Phase four is about seeing a goal of yours that's three years out and, and getting yourself energized for that goal. Phase five is about organizing and commanding the perfect, most productive day for yourself, all in your mind. And phase six is where you connect this with, with whatever is your spiritual or religious belief or your personal belief, you ask for a blessing. And that's it, that's the sixth phase. Now I got picked up by, um, by elite athletes. Uh, Tony Gonzalez, who's one of the top NFL um, uh, players, um, was tra I trained him on this. He spoke Amazing about this in multiple dude. publications. Reggie Jackson of the LA Clippers has spoken about this. Cra one of the craziest stories, Bianca Andrescu, she attended a class on the sixth phase. And at 19, she started, at 16, she started visualizing herself beating Serena Williams at the US Open. At 19, September 2019, Bianca was 19 years old. She beat Serena Williams. Wow won the US Open. When they asked her, how did you do it? She said, where's my phone, where's my phone? And then she pulled up my book, my first book, which talked about the sixth phase. She was a graduate of one of my classes and she tweeted about it. So um, she credited it in part partially with helping her win the US Open. And then rock stars and celebrities started talking about it. Gerard Butler, the actor said, if everybody did this, the world would be a more peaceful, compassionate place. Mig Miguel, the R&B star who, who did the song, Remember to Forget, one of my favorite songs, he gave an article in Billboard magazine and he spoke about doing the sixth phase with his entourage before his concerts, before going on stage. Now these people do it because when you're, when you're filming a movie, when you're getting on stage, when you're in a court, you instantly feel that difference. But it also works for entrepreneurs. So many entrepreneurs who have built massive companies do this and credit this with giving them the fortitude, the drive, the power, the mental well-being to do what they do because entrepreneurs are basically athletes building a product. Mm. Yeah, I love that. It's one thing I've talked about with business is it's the sport that you can play forever. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about your body giving out, which is wonderful. Uh, like I said at the beginning, the, the six phase meditation method I think is really fantastic. It really would make the world a far better place. It will certainly impact people. Um, there are aspects of this that I think are worth really diving into. Mm -hmm. So. One, the idea of gratitude. Mm -hmm. why, why is that the place to start? Why is it so impactful? Why so many people talk about this? I can vouch for it in my own life, but what, what's the juice behind so, gratitude? So firstly, we start with compassion. Gratitude is phase two, okay? Now, let's talk about, let's jump into phase two and talk about gratitude. So gratitude, according to science, is the human characteristic most widely associated with well-being. That means if there's one quality that you can adopt that is proven scientifically to produce overall well-being, it's this, it's gratitude. Do we know why? There are different theories, but, but here's what we know. We know that when you can elevate your levels of happiness, you perform better at work. Your health improves, your peace of mind improves, you sleep better. Just, just the work benefits are really startling. 
Sean Aker of Harvard University wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage, and this book is 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 really good. He speaks about how studies on on gratitude and happiness show that when we're happy. We do so much better at everything. Doctors are 19% better at diagnoses. Salespeople are 55% better at closing sales. And then there's the whole study of emotions. Uh, the study specifically, they measure your emotional states using a concept called PQ or positivity quotient. So PQ is your ratio of good thoughts to overall thoughts. Right? The more positive you are, the higher your PQ. Now here's the crazy thing: Shahzad Samin, who wrote the book PQ. He cites a study that shows that the num- the only thing that predicts the behavior of teams that correlates with high productivity on teams is not the leader, it's not the strategy, it's not the amount of of bagels you serve during a team meeting. It is PQ, the overall feeling of the people on that team. And so we are seeing that happiness doesn't just make us feel good; it's rocket fuel for productivity. It's rocket fuel for people like you and me that want to go out and do big things in the world. No doubt, I when I think about one of the the mindset that an entrepreneur has to have is both optimistic and accurate, basically. Mm-hmm. So you need a vision of the world that is true yeah. and optimistic. I would say that you need to be optimistic because if you're not, then you're just not going to take action. Do you think that there's something else going on, or is it just that that it allows you the belief that like, hey, this might actually work, right. and therefore you move forward? So I think that if we think of ourselves purely from a biological perspective, right, our brains perform better when the right chemicals are being released: serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. The practice of gratitude. Releases the right chemicals. You're building your business based on the quality of your brain. If your brain is in a healthy state, you're better able to get access into states of focus, states of flow, states of creativity, states of um, where states of cognition, where your processing speed is is better. And gratitude is one of those ways to optimize. Your thinking optimizes your brain. Ultimately, you're building your business with your brain, and I think that's why it works. That's why so many studies show that we do our work best when we are happiest.、Mm. Talk to me about visualization. You go into a lot of detail in the book. I、yeah. particularly liked your story about your Taekwondo competition.、Right. Uh, be careful what you visualize.、Yeah. Um, why is visualization important, and how do we do it well? I think. I think why it's important. So visualization is important if you do it at a particular brainwave state. So if you're visualizing at the waking state, which is beta. Now this is measured through a device called an EEG. It means an electroencephalograph. It means your brain is beating at around、uh, 14 to 21 cycles per second. I don't know if it's effective. The studies that show it's effective show that it works when you're doing it at a relaxed state, and that's why you do it when you meditate,、mm. right? So visualization. There's two things. One, it actually affects your biology, and two, it actually affects your performance. So again, let's talk about studies.、Uh, there've been numerous studies that show that visualizing yourself getting better, healing, can actually help increase your your rate of healing. And then there's performance. There were studies on basketball players.、Um, Alan Richardson,、uh, I believe he's a psychologist in, in in Australia. He found that visualizing yourself shooting hoops. And seeing it land in the basket is almost as effective as actually practicing in the court.、So、crazy.、Uh, practicing in the court produced a 25 percent、uh, increase in performance. Visualization alone, 24 percent increase in performance. Do you have to visualize like? Because I know Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about the same thing. He does lifting, the same thing. And he's thing, like,、right? you've got to imagine you've got to your arm your growing, growing in the mountains and、right. the, the contraction. If you're practicing the basketball one, do they have to like feel it, feel, feel the motion, yes, feel yes. the ball release? Yes. So this this is what. Optimizes it. You feel the emotion. You feel the elation every time you hit that hoop. So the feelings are.、Important. Do you need to feel the physicality or just the no, elation? The more you can feel, the better. So, in fact, I believe it's all about feeling, right? Because it's not about what you see. Someone who was born blind can still practice this. It's about what you feel. So let's say you、It's、want、really、you want to build your business. Your business is at one million in revenue.、Mm-hmm. You want to get it up to ten million in revenue. You visualize that. You visualize how would you dress? How would you feel? What would your office look like? How would you treat people? What would your day go like? And if, and I'm not saying you're creating magic that's making this happen. I'm saying you're conditioning your brain to believe 
I can do this. And you're conditioning yourself to take on the right feelings, the right behaviors that then show up in your life. Mm. The more you take on these behaviors, the more you start believing something is possible, that's gonna give you the impetus to actually get there. I took my business to 100 million revenue, about a billion in valuation, you've done the same thing. I bet you, you never stop dreaming of the next level and the next level and the next level. And I did the same. And so to me, visualization was always part of my daily practice. No matter where I was in business, I always visualize the next level. It's interesting, you're giving me a lot of credit. Thank you, it's very kind. I don't think I was as systematic as I would advise other people to be. I think that the way that you walk people through it is far better than what I actually did. Um, I was really just focused on what do I need to learn? What do I have to get better at? But I, visualization feels like an underutilized thing for me because every time I do it, so I, in Impact Theory University, I'm always telling people, you should be surprised by failure. Don't rehearse it. Now that's me giving me the mm -hmm. advice that I needed because I would sit there and unintentionally visualize things going wrong okay. so that I could be prepared to like, how do I extricate myself from this? Especially because uh, for a long time, I suffered from just debilitating anxiety. Mm. My anxiety was largely diet related. So once I cleaned that up, it went away, but I didn't know that at the time. So as I would, to your point about what you're feeling when you're visualizing, it matters a lot. What I would be feeling when I was visualizing mm -hmm. a meeting or whatever is anxiety because I was right. feeling it at the time. I had generalized anxiety. So no matter what I was visualizing, I felt anxious while I was doing it. And so I would get this feeling of dread coming into like whatever this thing was gonna right. be. And when I tried to use visualization, I couldn't conjure the right images. I couldn't get the right feeling. So I was like, oh God, I don't, mm. I don't know that I wanna use this. Now what I did find worked better, although now I think if I were to use your method of really trying to embody the feeling, it would work a lot better. But I would describe it either in written words or I would do like an internal actual monologue where instead of trying to conjure the images, I would say the words. I would say things, in my mind, you walk into the room, Everybody's stoked that you're there. Yes. You sit down powerfully. So even though I wasn't feeling it as much as I wanted to be, I was painting exactly. a psychotically clear Because image. it's not about the visualization, right? Remember the, the, the example of the blind person, the person born blind. Does that mean that visualization doesn't work for them? No, it's about the feeling. Whether you use words or you use visuals, it's about the feeling that it's generating. Yeah, it's interesting. When I think about the brain, and how it is a caloric hog, that you have an impulse from an evolutionary perspective to be lazy effectively. Mm -hmm. And then so you, your brain myelinates, right? So, okay, we're gonna think this a lot, we're gonna feel this a lot, then I'm gonna myelinate these um, neurons together. So neurons that fire together, wire together. What they're talking mm -hmm. about is that myelination process. So that it's easier to think and feel that thing, whatever you do repeatedly. And I feel like that's a big part of why visualization is gonna work. Right. One, you can interrupt your negative feelings as you are dreading this thing by forcing yourself to imagine it going well, to think about all the things you would need to do for it to go right. And then also, if you do that enough, your brain is gonna be like, oh, I guess this feeling of feeling good, feeling accomplished, like it's gonna work, I'm gonna be doing this a lot, so I better make this easier to do. And so now you're in the right zone. Walk people through though, what happened to you at the Taekwondo tournament, because oh, it's right, right, very right, interesting. Right, right. Um, I was talking about how when I was 17 years old, well, before, before, so my first ever trip to the United States, I came here as a martial artist to compete at the US Open uh, Taekwondo Championships, just like Bianca Andrescu saw herself winning the US Open. When I was 17 years old, I visualized myself being an international martial arts fighter. And um, the story in that book, the story in that book, there are two parts to the story. So first I gotta tell the preface. Before I even had the balls to visualize myself being an international martial arts fighter competing at the US Open in Colorado Springs in 1993, I had to see some evidence that visualization worked. Now, when I was growing up as a teenager, I had really, really, really bad skin disease. So my face was covered in acne and it really affected my self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I remember growing up, I didn't have friends. I considered myself ugly. I never went out on a date with a girl, even though I had many crushes until I was maybe 22. Wow. I had l very little self-confidence in terms of who I was as a person because of my skin. Now, when I was 17, I read in a book on visualization that the skin is the organ that 
science shows is most susceptible to the human mind. Mm. And so armed with this, I started practicing creative visualization. Now the model I use came from Jose Silva. Um, Jose Silva, who founded the Silva Method, which is, I said, uh, to be fully transparent, I later acquired the rights to that, and that's now on Mind Valley. Okay, but what he said was, you're visualizing your skin getting better, and there's a particular modality, and you're doing it at a relaxed level of mind, the alpha brainwave frequency, three times a day. Each visualization session takes three minutes. So I had five years of bad skin. It started at 13. Now I was 17 years old. Five years of bad skin. And I did this Silva methodology. Uh, this is the same imagery therapy I spoke about earlier that Dr. O. Carl Simonton tested. In five weeks, my skin healed. Wow. So again, the protocol was three minutes a day, three times a day, so nine minutes total. In five weeks, my skin healed. My pimples disappeared. Armed with that, I was like, wow, this stuff is awesome. What else can I do? So the next thing was improving sporting performance. My father had enrolled me in Taekwondo classes to build up my confidence because I honestly didn't really have that much. And I decided I want to take this to the next level. I want to get a second degree black belt, which I did. And then I want to compete at the US Open. But unlike many other athletes, I was obsessed with seeing, with just being at the US Open and seeing America. I didn't actually see myself winning a medal, which was stupid, stupid, stupid. So I show up at the US Open in Colorado Springs. I got that far. I show up for the championships and I'm wearing these thick glasses. I was that much of a nerd. You know, those giant glasses from the late 90s, like the lenses go all the way down. You can clean your lenses by licking them. So I show up with these giant glasses. My power is minus 700, short-sighted. So the glasses are this thick. And these are sports glasses. In Malaysia, you can fight with these glasses. In the USA, apparently not. I get in the ring and the referee blows a whistle. And he's like, yo, kid, you can't wear those glasses here. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, I don't care if you can do this in your country. This is in America. Your glasses break. A piece of glass enters your eye. You sue us all for $10 million. Take those glasses off. So I'm like, but I can't see without these glasses. Remember, this was 1993. Contact lens technology wasn't really developed right. yet, right? He's like, I don't care. Take those glasses off. So I take off my glasses and I'm freaking blind. And I'm facing Glenn Ryback, the Dutch national champion. And if you know anything about Dutch people, they are crazy tall. And Taekwondo is a kicking spot. So the taller and skinnier you are, the more an advantage you have. Yeah. Within, within 10 seconds, I feel a hit to my head and I'm on the ground. Mm. I get back up. I'm like, where the fuck is this guy? I, I was ready, ready to go for him if I could actually see him. 36 seconds into it, the second kick, I'm on the floor again. And at this point, my referee knows that I'm going to be killed if he doesn't get me out. He tro tosses in the towel. Whoa. I am out. I was officially the fastest knockout at the 1993 US Open Taekwondo Championships in Colorado Springs. That's I ended nice. up in hospital. Jesus. Yeah. So I, I wish I'd seen myself actually walk out of the ring <laughs> with a medal. I saw myself walk in the ring, which I did. Walk in the ring proud, feeling all badass. Um, I wish I'd seen myself actually walk out of the ring rather than walk out of the Colorado Springs yeah. <laughs> Medical Center. Yeah, that's hilarious. Visualization is such a big deal, especially for kids, being able to see yourself getting right. good at something. As a kid, I was really, not even just as a kid, into my 20s, maybe even the beginning of my 30s, I really despised competition. Yeah. And I would have told, oh man, people that are competitive, what assholes. But the reality was I was just afraid that I couldn't win. And right. so the idea of being competitive and it wasn't conscious, I really did think it. I really did think that, oh, competitiveness is just, it's bullshit. But then as I started to realize, oh wait, I can actually get better at things that I suck at. All of a sudden, then I was like, whoa, I kind of want to compete. Like I want to mm -hmm. put myself out there. I got really sad that I didn't take sports seriously because I never had that camaraderie, that the um, team sports vibe that you get. Every sport I did, I did yeah. solo because I thought, well, if I fail, at least I only take myself down. And once I realized, oh, you can actually get better at things, then I was like, oh man, that would have been a lot of fun to really contribute to a mm -hmm. team, to be part of something, to push myself. It's part of why I like video games now, to be competitive, because I only play, yeah. I play one game, but it's, you get to be a team. So my wife, my sister and I play as a fire team. And I love the idea that you can push yourself, you can get better, 
improve and then like really put it out there and compete. But alas, I did not have visualization or meditation or any of this stuff, which speaking of which, this is a big push for you guys at Mind Valley. Mm -hmm. What is missing in education today? What should kids be taught that had I or anybody else been taught at that age would make our lives better? So you want the easy answer or the difficult answer? I actually want the difficult one. Give me like the okay. full memo jam. So, so, so we actually look at life from, um, uh, the Mind Valley model is to look at life from 12 different dimensions. Um, and we just uh, acquired a company called Lifebook. We acquired uh, um, a significant stake in the By company. By the way, brother, what you've done with the business is incredible, Thank man. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we're pretty excited. So what we're trying to do with the education model is this. You know, so many of us, were trained based on official government sanctioned curriculums. And that isn't enough in the world today. So we start with getting you through the Lifebook approach, really clear on your goals, really clear on your vision. When you take Lifebook by Mind Valley, you end up with a hundred page book. Imagine a hundred page book with absolute clarity in the life you want to create in all 12 of the different dimensions of your life mm -hmm. that we look at. For each of these dimensions, you understand your beliefs. What do I believe about love? What do I believe about my body? You understand your why. Why do you want to get healthy? Why do you want to be a father? You understand your vision. What does a family look like to you? What does a business look like to you in intricate detail? And then you develop your strategy. How do you get there? Now, once you have this as a base, our AI analyzes this. And as our AI analyzes this, we start creating a custom education from you. We have 61 of the world's greatest teachers and everything from building a business to leadership, to meditation, to, um, to developing a monk-like brain, to speed reading, that's Jim Quick. So many of these teachers you've had on the show, to parenting, mm -hmm. Dr. Shafali, to self-esteem, Marissa Peer. And all of this education is customized for you. We're building an education that's customized to your vision of who you want to be, not some official curriculum. But we're gonna go further. The next thing we're gonna do is we're building a private social network so we can now connect you to the right people. Wherever in the world you're traveling to, you show up in Berlin, we'll be able to say, okay, Tom, these are five people you need to meet in Berlin because these people can help you with your vision. They've really figured out some aspects of this vision. All these are people that you can help. And the third thing that we're gonna do is supplementation because the food we take today isn't healthy enough. Mm. So we're developing, we're working with some incredible scientists to develop supplement lines that can put you in the right state to move towards your vision, whether it is health and wellness, brain optimization, or maybe focus, maybe creativity, maybe put you in a more loving state so your, your dates and your relationships are, are juicier. So these three things are really important. And this is what we are working on. Now, we are, we are fairly complete with the first part, which is the education, the social network, the supplements, all of that is coming in the next two years. Mm. What are the 12 areas that you have broken this down into? So, so we won't have time to go into all of the area, but I'll give you a couple. School tells you, pretty much prepares you for your career. It's designed to get you a job. I believe in the 1920s, there's a, there's a legend, we don't know if it's true, that Calvin Coolidge said, that, said this, the purpose of education is to create cogs in the wheels of, machine, of industry. And that's a pretty lousy way to define education, right? So we look at this, we look at areas such as your physical body, your intellectual capacity, how fast are you learning, how fast are you growing, your emotional states, what are your persistent emotions that you experience from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep? Mm. We also look at areas that relate to your relationship with other people, your social life. Who are your friends? What do you do with your friends? We don't set goals for our social life, but it's important. Mm, give goals me an for your well. How often are you connected to other inspiring individuals that can elevate you? How do you serve your friends? Who are the people that you are closest to? All of these matter. Mm. I'm sure you've heard that Jim Rohn quote: "We are the sum of the people we are closest to." Then we look at goals for your relationship life, you look at goals for your parenting life, and then you look at goals for what you're trying to create. So some of the other categories are money, your career. Uh, we look at your life vision, which is your legacy, what you wanna leave to the planet when you die. So there are 12 categories, and in each of these categories, 
you are going really, really, really deep within the four questions. Mm. It's really interesting, man. That's, it is fascinating to watch education change before our very right. eyes. I've heard you say that, look, if you can get an education for free, go for it, yeah. amazing. Um, but if not, you're probably better off with something like Mind Valley. Yeah. Where do you think I, I firmly believe, I firmly believe that the quality of your life will be better, significantly better, if you are a Mind Valley member than if you have a university degree from 98% of the universities in the world. It's a bold statement, but makes sense. One would think you'd build that which you really want to see in the right. world. Do you guys ever plan to get into hard skills like engineering or things like no. that or no. not your specialty? You think it's being done well elsewhere? No, the reason for that is because they are, they are great companies that do that. If you want to learn programming, you know, you go to Plural Site. They are great digital academies if you want to learn to be a marketer. But the fact is that is not what makes us. I've been a programmer. I've been a writer. I've been a marketer. These were all just phases of my life. I'd go deep into one of these when I want to. What Mind Valley is focused on are life skills that are important for the entirety of your life. No matter what age you are, being able to understand parenting, conscious parenting, right? Now, teacher for that is Shafali Sabari is going to be important. Even if you're a grandparent, you want to be good to your grandkids. You're going to have, an, you might have nephews or nieces. Being able to understand your body is important no matter what phase of your life you're in. Mm. So we look at the skills which are truly important. I believe that my life would have been significantly richer if I'd spent time understanding my body to the degree which I would have, I, I'd, I'd spent even a semester at university learning computer engineering. Mm. No doubt. If you'd met me when I was 25, what would you have told me about parenting? Should I do it? I would say it's up to you, right? I think in today's world, I don't think everybody needs to have kids. I think overpopulation is, is, is a crisis. Um, but I know from my perspective as a father, parenting is probably the most rewarding thing you can experience. Parent, parenting and love, to be, and both of them are very widely connected. Being madly in love with someone and having that beautiful life together and having kids. I think these are two things that provide us so much fulfillment. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm sort of the same. Well, I'm not sort of the same. I am the same. I am very grateful that people have kids. I think somebody has to do yeah. it. Uh, but for me, right. every time, it, the only real way to say it is I really want to have kids, but I really want to not have kids more, just a little bit right. more than I want to have kids. So it's tough. It is, uh, I think it's ready-made fulfillment. So if somebody were to ask me, I would say like, you should really think long and hard mm -hmm. before you don't have kids. Right. I think most people, the default answer is probably the right answer, which is to have kids, do it well, do it consciously, like be aware of what you're doing. But that feels like for the most people, it's gonna give them that the deepest sense of fulfillment is I think the, the right word, nature is sort of in-baked thing. But going back to um, overpopulation, what do you th what do you think about uh, people like Elon Musk who are more worried about the flip side? Mm -hmm. So, I I love Elon. Uh, Elon's mom, May Musk, is one of our teachers on Mind Valley. Right. Yeah, she teaches a program on for for women over forty on going out there and conquering the world. So I'm a big, big, big fan of the Musk family. Mm. Absolutely huge fans of the Musk family. Um, but I don't know if I agree with Elon that our biggest crisis right now is, is that humanity might be wiped out by an asteroid. I believe our biggest crisis could well be climate change. And I appreciate Elon for what he's doing with Tesla because he's tackling two, two very different things, right? I don't know if overpopulation is our biggest problem right now. Sorry, I don't know if underpopulation, underpopulation. is our biggest problem right now. Gotcha. Yeah, that to me, I think is, um, I haven't looked into it closely yeah. enough to have a really strong opinion, but it is very disconcerting. Like when you look at what's going on in Japan and you see like we are getting in certain countries for sure, we're not at replacement levels. We've been right. well under, Japan's been well under for more than a decade. I think the US now has been in uh, non-replacement levels. Right. So it'd be interesting to see how people respond to that. It's pretty fascinating, man. The world is so mm -hmm. complex and getting into things like um, reading, I'm sure you've read uh, Noe Yuval Harari's book, yeah. um, 
there have been a few books Great that I've books. read recently about how like how things have come to be and the level of complexity and the way that things bump into each other and evolve into the next thing. Have you read Ray Dalio's um, Principles for Dealing with a Changing World Not Order? Yet. Oh, dude, you're going to love it. It's, I mean, it's terrifying. It was very uh-huh. unnerving. I had to stop reading it at night because it was like freaking me wow. out a bit. But it's actually influenced my decision making. Mm. And it's really got me thinking about uh, this idea. So his core thesis is basically this. There are only so many personality types. And because of that, human nature is what it is. And so we bump into each other in the same ways over and over and over. And that's why history rhymes. And because there are only so many different personality types and there are only so many different situations, like you can actually chart them out. And so he plots out the six phases that any empire goes through. Mm -hmm. And basically that he's looked at, I forget, he spent some ungodly amount of money, like over a hundred million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, researching the last, I think he went in like the last 2000 years, but with a high focus on the last 500 years and chronicled every empire as it rose and fell. And then charting where the U.S. is the current leader of the, mm-hmm. the, the current world leader, uh, that there, the sixth phase is basically total societal collapse. And he puts America somewhere in phase five, wow. which is like the decline. Yeah. And so I'm like, uh, a guy that makes all of his money off of understanding macro trends on a global level, who spent over a hundred million dollars researching all of these different cycles is like, OPS, maybe we yeah. should really stop and be thoughtful about where things are going. Yeah, it's interesting because I never, like I always just wanted to talk mindset like that was just actually ironically all i ever planned to talk about was business but to explain to people how to actually start a business i had to talk about mindset and now it's like yeah i might have to start looking more broadly and really thinking about in fact you talked about this i don't know if it was in the book i've read basically everything you've ever written or one of your interviews Mm -hmm. where you talk you quoted somebody i think if we all contribute our grain of sand like you don't have to want to tackle the whole world give me that quote I wish I could remember it. <laughs> Basically something like don't don't like, try to don't try to save the world, just contribute your own positive grain yeah. of sand. You don't I was, think the quote was you don't have to save the world, just don't fuck it up for the next generation. Also a very powerful way right. to say it. So as you build out this incredible machine designed to help people yeah. not fuck up the next generation, um, what are like some of the the things that have been most life changing for you? So for me, um, most life changing practices probably have been, have been so many because I study everything. In fact, starting tomorrow, I go on two different retreats just to learn about being human, right? So I'm constantly discovering things. But some of the things that have been incredible for me, number one has been, um, this is in no particular order, meditation for sure. The silver method, the six phase, both of those fall under meditation. Number two, high intensity interval training strength training. Uh, We have a program in Mindvalley called 10X and that has completely changed my body. Um, I've been able to to just shift the way I look, shift my energy level, shift my cognition, just through strength training. And in a short amount of time, right? Very, very short amount of time. What are you guys doing to optimize? How are you able to get results in a short amount of time? Well, let me, let me finish the five first and then we can dive deeper. And then WildFit. So WildFit is a nutrition program. I realized how badly I was eating and uh, I transformed my eating. And that also transformed my health. While it is not owned by Mindvalley, but we have an exclusive license to publish it. Lifebook, Lifebook is that program I told you about. We just took a a significant stake in the company. Lifebook is where you create such clarity on your life that you have a hundred page book on your entire life. And then the the fifth one is the the concept of the Mindvalley Quest, uh, which is dedicating 20 minutes a day to learning something. And so on Mind Valley, you pick a topic. So you want to pick Conscious Parenting by Dr. Shafali. You want to pick Improving Your Memory by Jim Quick. Or you want to pick maybe, you know, Leadership with Keith Ferrazzi. 20 minutes a day for 30 days, you go deep into that topic. And we layer on behaviors, habits, routines, so that you evolve into that person. So these five things have probably have a massive outsized impact on my life. Talk to me about the diet and exercise stuff. Yeah. So... Let's start with the the earlier question. How do you guys, what do you do in the program that optimizes for results in a short amount of time? So uh, with 10X, um, basically they are six exercises you do 
And these six exercises give you the maximum, maximum reach over your body. They cover about 85 to 90% of all the major muscle groups in your body. Okay, so that's called 10X Alpha. Now, what we are measuring there in terms of health is something called um, power to weight ratio. Power to weight ratio. So based on your weight in a, in a, in a particular slice of time, how much power can you output? Okay, so if you optimize for power to weight ratio, you find that an elite uh, athlete, so, so firstly, everything is in the metric system. Um, so it's kilograms. So it's kilograms over minutes in the gym. If, sorry, it's, it's total kilograms lifted and the number of times you've lifted these kilograms over minutes in the gym over your body weight. So an elite athlete would have a power to weight ratio in, in, in around the tens. Um, the average person would be maybe two to three to four. So um, if you're my age, if you're over 40, if you're above eight, that's really, really, really good. So you're optimizing for that. How much power can your body generate in a slice of time? So the 10X alpha routine, uh, so again, it depends on how much time you have. If you can only go to the gym once a week, the alpha routine takes precisely 12 minutes. So you literally get to the gym and then there are six exercises that you do. Two are for the leg, two are push exercises, two are pull exercises. So the leg exercises might be calves and they might be a leg press. The push exercise might be the chest press and the shoulder press. The pull exercise might be a lat pull down and then a row. Okay, these cover 85 to 90% of the muscles in your body. But you're doing it in a specific way. And that specific way is about, so let's say you're doing the chest press. It's two seconds push and then it's three seconds it's, it's three seconds on the reverse. Why? Because studies show that on the, on the reverse, it's about a 30% uh, greater muscle growth. So you're optimizing for muscle growth. It's done with a really high weight. So about 90% of what you can do is your one rep maximum. And it's done in 60 seconds. You open up the Mind Valley app, you listen to a particular metronome sound. Tick, 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 tick. That's one rep. So it's about five seconds. Mm. So you do 12 reps in about 60 seconds. Without resting, you go to the next machine. Without resting, you go to the next machine. And so assuming it takes you about a minute to set up the machine and sit down, the entire thing takes 12 minutes. But you're going maximum weight. It is freaking painful. But we teach a, a philosophy called chase the pain, understanding that that pain, that pain means you're doing it. That pain, so especially in the last reps, if you can feel that pain, that's when you're creating the greatest muscle stimulation. Mm. And so um, it's, it's a phenomenal routine. So I try to go to the gym two to three times a week, but still it's about 12 minutes each time. Not bad, it's fast. Yeah. What have you changed in your diet? So in the diet, I followed the protocol um, called WildFit. So WildFit is a really, really, really interesting diet routine. So I did it and I went from this was 2016 when I did it, and I used to be chubby. I used to have about, be 22% body fat. If you look at me in older episodes of uh, Impact Theory, I kind of looked different. I went from 22% body fat to about 13 to 14% body fat, wow. which is what I am right now. Okay, that's considered pretty good for a man over 40. Um, and um, while fit is 90 days, and you trick your body into giving up all the bad conditioned behavior. You understand where hunger comes from. You understand emotional eating. You understand how your love for your mother may be making you eat certain things that you shouldn't be eating, and you stop the cravings. So for example, before Wild Fit, I would have two Starbucks lattes a day. Oh. A day, two Starbucks lattes. And um, I didn't even really think that was bad for me because uh, I think it's about 250 calories per latte. Now I only drink black coffee. If I even take a latte, it just doesn't feel right. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean you never eat ice cream or you lattes never eat have milk, pizza. Right? What? Lattes latte have latte milk? would have milk, yeah. It just means that you don't crave it. If, if there's an office party and they're serving pizza, you don't feel like you need to eat it. Mm. You understand all of the con social conditioning that's taking place, causing you to, to feel like you need to grab that slice from the social pressure to the conditioning that you get from watching a Pizza Hut ad on television. And as a result, people go through a transformation. Now, Eric Edmeets, the creator of WildFit, also created the concept called BCD, Behavioral Change Dynamics. And he's actually changing your behavior. He's a former Tony Robbins trainer. 
So he's applying a little bit of NLP there. Mm. But in 90 days, people see a phenomenal transformation. So after I did it, I put a hundred of my employees on it and the record weight loss was 91 pounds. And then we had two employees wow. who lost 51 pounds and all of this in three months. What are, if you had to boil it down, so carnivore diet, eat only meat, paleo, uh, eat only things found yeah, in nature. About, so like Walford, what's the... it's, Walford is not really a diet. And that's the thing, diets don't really work. The, 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 the failure rate on diets is astonishing. It's over 90% because diets are often based on willpower. Mm. And willpower is tough. It's tough to do things just based on willpower. While fit is like a reset of your brain. You just show up differently. You start eating differently. And Eric is such a genius as a trainer. Like this, this dude is incredible. When I put him on stage at Mind Valley, he just spoke at Mind Valley University. We had maybe 200 trainers. He got a score of 4.99, highest rated speaker. Like, and this is out of a thousand people attending. Wow. 4.99, right? This guy is masterful. I think that's why Tony Robbins used to put him on a stage. And so Eric knows how to flip the switches in your brain, completely mesmerize you to the point where you think about your body and your food in a different way. But it's not just for losing weight. People see hair grow back. People's mm. skin improve. My skin improved so much on Wild Fit. Uh, I was having hair loss. That stopped. Um, my energy levels changed. I need to eat a Mars bar at the office at 5 p.m. as an afternoon snack to keep my energy up. I did not realize that I was just, you know, I was giving myself a sugar mm -hmm. spike and I was so, so hooked on sugar, I needed sugar to fuel my productivity. Now when you do WildFit, he pulls your internal engine away from sugar, boom, all the way to fat. And your body is now trained to burn fat rather than sugar. Yeah, I was gonna ask like what that core constituency is. So he's yeah. getting you off of fat. Sounds like he's pulling So I'm not the out. expert. I've, I've been through it. Mm. Um, Mind Valley is the exclusive publisher of it. I'm not the expert. You should have Eric on this show, but Walfit is formidable. Very, very intriguing. Dude, what you build is incredible. The book is amazing. Where can people follow you? So you can follow me on Instagram at Vision, at V-I-S-H-E-N. I love it, brother. Thanks for coming. Everybody, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Awesome. Awesome. If we're not a deep narcissist, we have that thermostat where things start hurting us a little bit and we bring ourselves back up through the self-esteem mechanism so we don't get too depressed and too down. And there's an element of unreality to that, but it's very valuable. And I would never, ever, ever want to burst that.